Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is gravity. And with me here in the studio is one of our own team members, Liam Finn. Liam, it's good to see you on this side of the camera. It's good to be here, Don. Thank you. Well, we're going to have two different segments to our program, program as we usually do. Uh, the first segment will be more of a discussion of the history of gravity, its concepts over time. And then in part two, we'll actually have a demonstration showing how we believe gravity works. So uh, let's get started. So Liam, fill us in on some of the, uh, the history of this attractive topic. Well, <laughs> I love the pun. Um, I suppose that started at the beginning where we, all, we actually believed the world was flat. Most of the people, most of the pre-scientific world believed that the world was a flat disk covered by a dome, and the dome rotated, and the world never rotated and never moved. And because of this, um, we, that's how, how we saw the world. But um, that changed around um, 384 BCE, when people started traveling a lot more, and they noticed that the positions of the stars changed as they traveled north and south. Um, and that put them in the idea that the world is actually a sphere rather than a flat disk. But it still didn't change their view of what we call a geocentric model. And the geocentric is where the Earth was not moving, it was stationary, because we didn't feel it spin, so we weren't, we weren't turning. And everything else, like the sun and the stars and the planets, rotated around Earth. And so that is the geocentric model, and it's what, we, what they believed in for, for hundreds of years and thousands of years. Up until around um, 3 BCE, um, a Greek uh, philosopher called Aristarchus came up with the idea of a, what we call a heliocentric model. And um, what his view was, that the sun was the center, and the planets and the earth rotated around it. And everyone thought he was crazy. No one believed him. Everyone thought, this could not be possible. We don't feel ourselves spinning. How could we be spinning? And so the idea was kind of dropped for a long time, until, until um, 1543, when a Nicholas Copernicus released um, a document called um, On the Revolution of the Celestial Spheres. And in this uh, model, uh, Nicholas Copernicus um, proposed the idea that the sun was the center and the planets and the stars, and uh, sorry, the planets orbited around the sun, including Earth. And again, he had no support from anybody until um, actually the year he released this document, it was the year he died. So after, he de after his death, he actually received support from, and people believed in the content that he produced was um, Galileo Galilei and also uh, Johannes Kepler started believing and gave some credence to what he was saying. And that stayed as the model up until, and it wasn't really believed because they still believed in the geocentric system, up until um, 1609 um, when Galileo first pointed the telescope into the night sky. And when he did so, he started seeing things that no one else saw before. He was seeing objects like, um, he saw planets with ears, which is Saturn. Mm -hmm. That's how he described Saturn. Um, then he was looking at the planet Venus and, and Jupiter. And he found these two very interesting. Because when he was observing Venus, two things were happening. First of all, Venus was appearing sometimes in the morning sky, sometimes in the evening sky, which was kind of a bit strange. Also, he noticed that Venus was actually um, was in phases. So it had phases like the moon, you know, crescents and so on. And this didn't really fit ver in very well with the geocentric model because in the geocentric model with the Earth being the center of everything, we would always see the full face of an object that we were looking at in the night sky. We would not see it in phases. Also, he turned around, he turned his focus back towards, um, towards Jupiter. And he was noticing Jupiter and he had these little dots beside Jupiter that he does thought were stars. But on observing them, he noticed they were changing position, which one did not match with the geocentric model because according to the geocentric mo model, everything in the universe stays stationary and, and, and or it stays in the same position and moves around Earth. And as well as that, by observing these, these objects beside Jupiter, he noticed some of them, sometimes there was four of them, other times there were three. And by with further um, observation, he noticed um, one of the objects would move very, very close to the planet and disappear. 
and then all of a sudden it would reappear on the other side, which gave them the idea that these were actually moons. So if there's moons orbiting this planet, how could it be possible that, um, why, why would it make sense that um, there's other things are not orbiting other planets as well? Exactly. Which, is, which falls more in line with um, what we believe today, which is what we call the heliocentric model. But um, when Galileo put this idea forward, um, he was called a charlatan. He was put under house arrest by the church. He was, um, he was no one believed him. He, was, right. he, he actually called his telescope an object of evil portraying false images of the sky. Exactly. He was, his view on things was flying full face into the teachings of the church for oh, over a thousand years. Oh yes, went totally against everything in the church. And the, um, and this was uh, the only people that, um, that actually uh, kind of listened to some of what was, what was said by Galileo was Johannes Kepler, which was, um, which was later on. And Johannes Kepler came out with the idea um, by going by uh, observations from another astronomer called Tycho Brahe. And by looking at uh, Tycho Brahe's um, information, he was turned around, he was, he calculated the orbit of the celestial spheres. And with this, he actually released the, the laws of planetary motion because he actually calculated where they'd be in the night sky at different times of year. And that brings us up to, and, but still, even though he did this, at the very same time, they still believed in the geocentric model where the Earth was the center of everything. And even though it was a sphere already, everything was still rotating around the Earth. And that ended um, when one Englishman named, um, named uh, Sir Isaac Newton released his uh, princi uh, Principia Mathematica. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica um, introduced the very first concept of the term gravity, where he denoted gravity as being a force that was actually pulling objects into orbit around the star. So the planets were pulled into orbits around the star and was the same force that caused objects to fall on, the planet Earth, on our planet Earth. And that was basically the end of the, um, that put an end to the geocentric model where Earth was the center of everything and brought in the, into play the, uh, in, we brought into play the heliocentric model where the sun was the center and all the planets orbited around the sun. So that was the very beginning of, 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 of the, the way we see the universe today. Sure, and didn't, uh, didn't Galileo himself do a little bit of work with this idea of gravity? Um, a little bit, a, a, a little bit, but he, he didn't have any concept of it really, whereas uh, Sir Isaac Newton brought up the real concept of it. He actually brought the, put together math related to it and so on, which actually reinforced his, his theories where Galileo didn't really have any, any of that backing. It was something he observed, but he couldn't prove. So we had the observations of Brahe. We had Kepler taking those observations, putting them down in physical laws. Yes. And then we have Newton, who is developing the math and the formulas to prove out mathematically yes. what we see and observe. Yeah, to demonstrate those. Yes. And ever since Newton um, brought out this idea of, of gravity, it was accepted as the default right up until 1915, where when a young man named, um, named uh, Albert Einstein brought up the idea of changing this. He said, he said that gravity is not a pulling force. He says, he, Albert Einstein said, gravity is a result of an object being affected falling um, because of the warping of space-time. And that was part of his general theory of relativity. And he, uh, he said in, the, in this model, he said that when an object is traveling in a straight line, its speed and trajectory, when passing near an object that actually has a large enough mass that warps space-time, that the object, as it's traveling in a straight line, its straight trajectory will get, will get changed into a curve that we call a geodesic, going around that object, which causes the object to actually go to orbit. And he also said that this will happen without the influence of forces, meaning gravity is not pulling on you. It's going to happen without gravity, according to the general theory of relativity, 
is because of the warping of space time just happens. And not this inward pull of yeah. gravity that we operated on for 150 years? Yeah. 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 And then he also said that if you ever get a, an object that's large enough in mass, what it's going to do is it's going to warp space time so much that even light will be affected and the result will be a black hole, which uh -huh. is where the idea of a black hole came from, which is Einstein's theory of relativity. And he also predicted another thing, that when two very large mass objects are orbiting each other, they create ripples through space-time. And only last year we proved that these ripples really exist, where we actually detected gravity waves. So for hundreds of years, we believed it was all one thing, and we were, we were off by an awful lot, according to Einstein. Well, I know in the second part of our program, we're going to actually have a demonstration mm -hmm. uh, of how these principles work. Uh, it's quite an exciting principle. I've seen it done at the, at the Science Center, so I'm glad Liam is going to be here to uh, demonstrate it for all of our viewers. Right now, we're going to take a quick break so that we can change the set to bring you the demo. Uh, if you have any questions, please send us an email. Uh, we ask that you do that. We like to hear from you. So you can see the email address down there at the bottom of your screen. And right after Term of the Month with Stephen Witte, we'll be back with our demo on gravity. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month for June 2016 is Gravitational Constant. Now the gravitational constant appears in Newton's equation, which gives you the force between two masses at some distance from each other. The current accepted value is 6.74 times 10 to the minus 11th Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Now there are some more digits that are known, uh, but the value isn't known as well as some of the other uh, constants of the universe, speed of light and so on. Uh, a space experiment has been proposed where you have a big sphere, you see that on the left, and you have a, a hole drilled through it, maybe half an inch in diameter, and you have a little sphere that is injected into the big sphere. And this little sphere will oscillate back and forth while a laser that's on the right measures where it is. And this experiment should give us about three more digits to the gravitational constant big G. So that's gravitational constant, the term of the month for 2016. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back to the show. In the first part, we were talking about the history and concepts of gravity. In this part, we're going to have an actual demonstration uh, highlighting these concepts. So, Liam? Okay, so Don, this is just a, a ring of tubing. And stretched over is some, is some lycra or spandex, which gives us the, and it represents um, the fabric, being fabric, of space time. And on this material, we're going to sh demonstrate to you some of the, um, the theories around Einstein's theory of relativity. So if you have space, and in Einstein's theory of relativity, he puts space and time together as one, so it's space time. And if you have space time and you send an object across in space time in a straight line, it travels unhindered in a straight line. Newton even talked about that as well. Correct. Will travel in infinitely in a straight line unless it's acted upon by an outside force. Correct. Now, if you put a larger mass object on, in space, it actually warps space time a little bit more. And if you watch the, the way it has dented the fabric down here. Yes. And if I send the same object across, it will actually fall in towards, well, the object in the center. It will eventually work its way in there. Okay. So that proves that an object is actually warped space-time. If sent in a straight line towards the object, or without any real speed, it will fall in towards that large mass object. Now, if I, if may I have that weight? If I have a slightly heavier object, this is a three pound weight, and I place that in the center of my gravity well, it actually warps space-time an awful lot more. There's more mass, so there's more warping. Correct, the larger mass, the more it affects which falls in line again with Einstein's theory. And if I get an, uh, any object and I send it off at 90 degrees from that in a straight line, I'm going to release it in a straight line, it will turn from a straight line into a geodesic, which is an orbit. And the same goes for this 
and this, and even a slightly larger marble will do the exact same thing. So they are all ending up in a geodesic, even though I sent them off in a direct straight line. So let's take it one step further, and we're going to get a really large mass object. So going from this large marble, which is not really heavy enough, I'm going to change the planet to being a larger mass to its ball bearing. So if I take the ball bearing and I send it off in a straight line, it, is, it too is going to follow the line of a geodesic according to Einstein's theory, and it's going to go off and spin and orbit the large object in the center, the star or whatever large object is in the center. Now that just proves one thing, that one object will orbit the other. It doesn't prove that, um, like why does this, the, moon, the, the moon orbit Earth or so on. So I'm going to prove why the moon orbits Earth. If you take the large mass object again and place it on the fabric, you'll see that it actually dents it a little bit. It's just a little bit dipping down there. A little bit because it's a, it's a larger mass. Okay, and it's actually creating a dent, whereas a small marble would do very little. So we get the large mass object, and I'm going to take a small object, like a moon, that will represent the moon, that's smaller and less dense, and send them off at 90 degrees around the largest object being the star in the center. What will end up happening is the small object will actually orbit the larger planet. You can see it there. It's, it's going around the larger object as they both orbit our larger weight, the sun. Correct. And if you look at, say, let's say, Mar um, let's say Jupiter, even Mars, but mostly Jupiter and Saturn, they have more than one moon. And if we do multiple moons, okay, and send them off at the same time around, they too will orbit the larger planet, which proves, which goes to demonstrate that even small objects, like something the size of a planet compared to a star, actually warps the, the, the fabric of space-time, and because of this, that is why the moon orbits Earth, and that is why the Earth orbits the sun. Now, if we look a little bit closer, um, and we're going to use the one large marble again, we see the large object, the, the, the mass in the, of the, uh, the star in the center? Yes. If I take the large marble and I send it spinning around again, so in a straight line I'm going to release it, it creates, a, it turns into a geodesic, you see the slight wobble of the weight in the center. Yeah, just ever so slight, but it is Ever there. so slight. Well, that slight wobble, that slight tugging means, shows that the larger, the, the, the smaller object, being the planet, actually tugs on, on its star. And we use that in everyday science to measure the mass of, of a planet orbiting the sun. Because as the, as, the, as the large planet orbits, it tugs in the sun a little bit, and we can, we can measure that, that amount it tugs it, and that will tell us the actual mass of the, the planet that's orbiting. Now, one other thing this actually shows, that wobble, if you, if you see that wobble again, okay, and if you imagine it's going to be a larger object, so I'm going to use my hand to demonstrate the larger object. If you have the larger object, that's actually going to go around. You see that bigger ripple? Yes, it's much more exaggerated, it's, tipping from side to side. Well, it's also creating little, little shakes. If you look at the material, it wobbles and shakes a little bit. That shaking, that wobbling between the two larger objects, actually sh um, demonstrates another theory of Einstein, which is actually um, proves of um, gravity waves. Because two large objects, as they orbit each other, like black holes and our stars, they create ripples in space-time, which we just saw the, the ripples happening there. And those ripples in space-time are what we call gravity waves. And a hundred years after Einstein predicted them, last year we actually saw and could detect gravity waves for the first time ever. It's really changed profoundly our view of how the solar system and uh, objects in space do work. Yes. Instead of being an attractive force pulling inward, we can see demonstrated here with our fabric being deformed, Mm -hmm. or this, the shape changed, the actual mechanics of what we think of as gravity. Yeah, so gravity is actually not a, a real force, according to Einstein, as which, which we explained earlier on. Gravity is actually the effect of us falling, and we're falling towards the planet. So the reason why we walk on the planet Earth is we fall onto it. The reason why the moon orbits us is we, the moon is falling towards us, but it's doing so in a geodesic. The same the reason yes. why Earth orbits the sun, and the reason, same reason why our solar system, our sun, and many and billions of other stars orbit the center of our galaxy because of the supermassive black hole that's in our galaxy warps space-time and causes that 
um, geodesic to happen and, and create and is the reason why all the stars orbit around the our galaxy. And they all have momentum. They all have momentum. That's important. Right. The momentum, uh, looking at it in this term, like angular momentum. Correct. To keep that motion going around. If it had no angular momentum, it would just fall straight in. Straight in. So the momentum needs to be um, in a direction that's, um, that's fast enough, but it has to be 90 degrees from the object in the center. So that's what, if I did it this way, it just go to a loop and fall around it. If I did it too hard this way, it'll spin off and go off into outer space, which does happen with comets and so on. But if I do it exactly 90 degrees, we get our orbits. Our solar system. As defined by Sir Isaac, or by Albert Einstein. Now, it's interesting as we watch, we watch the marbles slow down and fall to the center. Yes. Uh, this doesn't happen in the solar system. No. Well, the reason why it's happening here is because as a marble moves, first of all, it's rolling on a surface, so that causes friction. And as well as that, the marble needs to push its way through the air. Now, we could decrease that by sucking the air out of the out of our studio, but none of us would survive, so that's kind of pointless. <laughs> but, um, but because of the friction of the air and the friction of the surface it's traveling on, that actually is the reason why it would slow down. But in space, it's a vacuum. There's no air. There's nothing to, for the planet to move against. And so that actually, that, that, uh, there's no friction on it, so it maintains its momentum. Moving around the sun for however many billion years. Five billion years so far and counting. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Uh, now, you've taken this out to uh, uh, several different locations. I know you work at the planetarium at Correct. Henry Ford College, and you had some experience with some of the students there. Well, I with the students and also some, some kids who come to the, to the shows there, and the kids really enjoy it because when I do it at the, at the planetarium, I let the kids get their hands in. I get them to actually try and make this happen. The moon orbit and the, planet, the, moon orbit the planet, and they inside. try a couple of times. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the fun of out of it, the fun in, in all of this is trial and error. And it's not just that they're learning about it; they're having fun doing so, which means they'll remember the outcome of it and they understand why it's happening. And it's the hands-on activity portion of it, rather than sitting there listening to adult talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Lectures can be boring, and it's better to getting involved and, and getting your hands dirty is ten times more fun than than. Than, uh, than just listen to someone talk and talk and talk. Or look at a video or yeah. anything like that. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, now this has been uh, a fascinating demonstration. Uh, it really does highlight the thought process, I say, of Einstein, mm -hmm. basically 100 years later, to uh, fully explain the phenomenon of why things work in space the way they do as far as one object orbiting another or several hundred billion stars orbiting the center of a galaxy. Yeah, it, it does, and it's, this simplifies it as well. You know, the, fabric, the warping of space is not just on a single plane, it's in multiple planes. So it's not just here, it's all different directions. So this makes it an easy concept for kids to understand, and it's a fun way for them to learn. It is, and I want to uh, thank my guest, uh, Liam Finn, one of our team members here at Astronomy for Everyone, for bringing to light and explaining in very simple terms uh, how gravity works. Uh, we're uh, going to be going to what's up uh, for this current month, uh, but before that, uh, we do want to let you know to uh, check our club website. Uh, the email, or the website, I should say, is uh, down at the bottom of your screen. We hope you've enjoyed uh, this presentation, and uh, as I just said, don't go away because we've got what's up with Stephen Whitty.
Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for June 2016? We have the summer solstice in June on the, on the 21st, so the rise time and the setting time of the sun doesn't change very much. Uh, the sun rises in Michigan anyway around 6 a.m. and it sets uh, at 9 or maybe 9.10 uh, by the end of the month. The uh, month starts with a new moon on the 4th. We've got a uh, first quarter on the 12th, a full moon on the 20th, and a third quarter on the 27th. Now here on June 15th, we have Mars and Saturn. Mars is in Libra, Saturn is in Ophiuchus. Uh, Mars and Saturn are near opposition. So for Mars, opposition was last month on the 22nd, so even late in last month. And, um, and so if you look at this top-down view of the solar system, uh, Mars is a little ahead of, or a little behind the Earth, because uh, we just had the opposition. So the, the line is uh, between the Sun and the Earth and then Mars. And then if you look at the bigger view, kind of that same angle, uh, you can see that Saturn is also out in that angle. So that's why they're in the same spot in the sky, more or less, and that's, um, and that's because they're, they're both near opposition. Now, also in this view, right at the top, is Comet Linear C252P. And uh, you'll need binoculars for this, uh, but it is uh, in Ophiuchus as well as Saturn. And uh, there is a bright star right near where, uh, uh, where uh, the comet can be spotted. So it's actually pretty easy to spot here in the middle of the month. Uh, earlier in the month for the comet is brighter. Physically, the comet is kind of near Mars. So it's right in the same direction. Uh, but it is uh, sort of above the plane of the planets uh, quite a bit. So it is not physically that close. It is right by the uh, Mars orbit and so on. It's pretty cool. Jupiter is in Leo, and uh, Jupiter had its uh, opposition uh, a, a bit ago, and so it, ha it sets at 2.20 in the morning uh, at the beginning of the month and midnight 30 by the end of the month. Uh, here we're seeing it with the moon. I like to put the moon in, the, in these shots. Uh, Uranus and Neptune. Uranus rises around 3.47 to, one, to about 2 a.m. Uh, by the end of the month. Neptune rises at 2.15 in the, in the morning to um, that sort of midnight 20. Um, and that's it for what's up in the night sky for June 2016. Keep looking up in the night sky for the greatest free show above your head every single night.